I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, into this world with liberty and justice for all. Please join in a moment of silence for our fallen servicemen and women. So welcome everyone. We're going to begin tonight with the oath of office for our new police officer, Officer Brendan O'Reilly. You want to come up? Commissioner, did you want to say a few words before or after the oath? Thank you, Mayor. We're proud to present Brendan O'Reilly. He's a graduate of Malvern High School and Cortland University, where he received a bachelor's degree in physical education. He was previously a high school physical education teacher, and he has coached numerous sports teams. He's also volunteers and serves the community as a Limbrook fireman since 2016, and was recently promoted to lieutenant. He's currently assigned to the Nassau County Police Academy. We're glad to have him, and we're glad to get some young blood. Right. Uh, I state your name. I put in order. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. Support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the laws and ordinances of the Village of Garden City. And the laws and ordinances of the Village of Garden City. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. The duties of a police officer with the Garden City Police Department. The duties of police officer with the Garden City Police Department. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. By the powers vested in me as the mayor of the village of Garden City, I declare you duly appointed. Congratulations. We do a picture with the board and then family, or? Is it just you and then the board? Okay. <laughs> Should we slide this way, guys? Which one? This one. Want to go in the middle here? Family, want to come up? Sure. Pictures. Family out. Family out. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's got a fan club, sorry. Nice <laughs> Let's 
Did I make a comment about Paul Rothenbaugh's wife? Or maybe you read trusting comments? Trusting comments? Okay. Yeah, no, I know. I know. I know. All right, so next we'll move to our newly added quick resident comments. And these are intended for residents who wanted to just tell us something quickly and have to, you know, head home for dinner, have someplace else they need to be, will not be able to stay for the whole meeting but had a quick comment they wanted to give us. So I'll open the floor. And this is only for quick comments, folks who are unable to stay for the whole meeting and they're limited to a minute. Anybody in the room who wanted to make a quick comment before leaving? Nope, okay. Anyone on Zoom who wanted to say something quickly but will not be able to stay on the line for the rest of the meeting? No. Okay, so um, we will move on now to uh, comments by department heads, um, beginning with Mr. Baroni. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. Uh, DPW has 12 items on the agenda tonight. I would like to direct everybody's attention to item 1B under finance as a request to transfer $17,500 from contingent to sanitation to fund National Waste Services. National Waste Services is responsible for removing the dumpsters at our dump um, or transfer station. Under public works, item eight is to approve rates for drug and alcohol testing. Uh, employees are selected at random for testing throughout the year. Uh, this is to meet compliance with federal DOT CDL requirements. Um, we also test non-CDL employees as required by contractual agreement. Uh, item number nine is to approve hourly rates for on-call GIS services with H2M. Um, it could be beneficial in the future to RFP out these on-call services. However, um, Mr. Carey and I would like to begin working on certain features of our GIS system right away. Uh, as of June 1st with the new budget. Um, so we would like to start using these rates immediately. Uh, item number 10 is a request to approve change orders for the Village Hall HVAC project. Both change orders total approximately $31,000, which includes a $10,000 credit. The reason for the change order is to separate the boardroom out from the downstairs HR and police department areas. Uh, in order to improve the quality of the working environment for the employees. It also includes giving the police department the ability to control their area separately. Oh, as we all know, they wear vests and a lot of equipment. So generally speaking, they like their area cooler than the HR department would like their area. Uh, item number 11 is to engage H2M to provide mandated OSHA safety training uh, specific to water department employees at a cost of $2,200. The cost is favorable to the village since the class is being shared by other water suppliers. Item 12 is to engage H2M to provide our semi-annual air emission certification report at a cost of $3,000. The Nassau County Health Department requires that the village certify the air emissions to the New York State DEC for our air stripper towers at wells 9, 8, 12, and 13. The air stripper towers are required in order to remove VOCs from our drinking water. Item number 13 is to engage H2M to provide lead and copper rule mandates and corrosion control treatment sampling at a total cost of $189,000, $189,700. This proposal is related to the levels of lead found in residential homes due to the presence of privately owned lead contaminating plumbing materials. The Nass County Health Department mandates specific compliance actions. This includes lead and copper sampling in June and December every year bi-weekly sampling in the distribution system, resident communications and coordination, GIS tracking, and the attendance at our village EAB meetings. Item number 14 is to engage H2M to provide professional engineering services related to design and construction of the permanent orthophosphate treatment at various well sites at a cost of $59,800. Engineering services are needed in order to replace the temporary orthophosphate treatment that was approved by the BOT last year. 
orthophosphate treatment has been implemented in an effort to reduce the corrosion impacts on lead contaminating plumbing materials within the village residence lines and is part of the overall mitigation plan the village has undertaken. Item number 15 is for the purchase of orthophosphate treatment chemicals from Cork, Car I'm sorry, Caris LLC. Uh, bullet point one is to ratify an additional expense of $20,000 to cover the time period of January 23 to June 23. The second bullet point is to approve rates going forward for Caris LLC to provide orthophosphate treatment chemicals in the 2023-24 budget. Item number 16 is uh, to ratify a proposal that was submitted by H2M for additional expenses incurred on the Maria Lane water tank project at a cost of $77,500. Additional construction related services were needed due to various delays by the tank contractor. I'd like to clarify that this is a ratification uh, for that proposal. Under award of bids, item 18 is to award the main avenue landscaping project to the second low bidder of Coastal Contracting Corp for a total of $268,550. The low bidder submitted a letter to rescind their bid. Item number 19 is to award the masonry facade restoration and roofing system for the Garden City, Garden City Library to the low bidder cornerstone at a cost of $740,500. The original budget for the project was $111,000, and the original scope of the project was only to replace the roof. However, it was determined that masonry repairs needed to occur as part of the roofing project. The request for a bond resolution of $650,000 is for the additional funding to allow us to award the project. The cost of the roof replacement is approximately $535,000, and the masonry work is approximately $205,000. Uh, that's all the items DPW has on the agenda this evening. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer. John, I have a question for you. Go back to 16. So explain this one to me exactly. Is this a matter, why is it, so is this a matter that the project took longer than expected and that's to breathe the additional cost here? Correct. So due to the various delays by the tank contractor, uh, there were additional construction services like inspection and management that needed to happen because the time period had extended. Mm. Uh, Ralph is in communication with legal on how they're going to mitigate who's covering that cost. Yeah, I would, that, that would be very interesting to see if that's going to work out right. If it was something that was being borne by us and we caused it, then you know we're on the hook. But if this is something that, that we're actually getting, we're being responsible for paying for that's not directly driven by us, we should be looking for some sort of compensation. Uh, understood. Well, they they did perform the services though, so at this point, understood. Understood. I mean, they perform services, but we want to make sure that we get compensated if it's not our responsibility. Absolutely. I did have a, a quick question for Mr. Baroni. Um, number eighteen. I think there's going to be some further comment. Um, I I know that um, Ralph had some comments, and and uh, you can see folks that he's not here tonight, and he does have some notes that we'll be sharing with you and. Um, we think we think uh, there'll be a claim made uh, to the MTA, I, I believe, for some of those money. So there'll be more comment on on that uh, particular item. Is, is that correct, John? That is correct. I believe that an application was made to the CBF uh, for the reimbursement of those funds. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that, oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, good. We'll get to Thank that. You. I think it's all approved, but we'll good. hear. Yes. Any other questions for Mr. Baroni? John, there's, a, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars in this agenda for H2M. Is this a result of things that were bid out, or is it a result of just continuation of services that we had historically retained them for? Uh, it is a result of continu uh, a continuation of services that we had historically, historically retained them for. Um, we do review each proposal. Uh, there are certain items that we don't give to them because um, we don't necessarily agree with the cost, such as the design for the repaving of the parking lot associated with Murray Lane. Um, but there's just certain things like the lead and copper rule. They, you know, they began it, so it would make sense to have them continue it and to see it through. Um, as far as the autophosphate treatment is uh, concerned, they came up with the design to implement the temporary system, so it would make sense to have them design the permanent system. So it is just a continuation of their services. All right. My only 
The only thing I wonder about is this a never-ending cycle is H2M by dint of what they've done in the past always going to be the provider and we don't have to resolve it now. It's just a thought that I had and if you and Giuseppe can think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, to, and to piggyback off of Trustee Kelly's comment, um, how difficult would it be to get an itemized list of all the work we've got H2M doing for us that we could you know, share with the board just to see what the numbers look like, right? In terms of the number of projects and the, and the dollar cost. No, we should be able to request that from the finance department. It'd be excellent, please. We'd like to see it. Yes, sir. Thank you. The GS, GIS support services, is that related to the hourly rates that we're seeing over on the item number 13? So no, it wouldn't, nine, it wouldn't yeah. be the same rates. It's a different project. Our on-call GIS services um, are for things that we need to do in-house that necessarily aren't involved with the lead and copper rule. So these are their rates uh, listed on item 13 per hour to do these various functions? Correct, correct. For um, for example, I am looking to implement a um, system for our catch basin cleaning reports. Right now we're on paper. You know, it's very tedious. They lose them. Uh, we have mandates for our annual stormwater pollution reports. Um, this would help move everything into a digital database um, so that we'd be able to provide the information to the DEC uh, quickly and it's better record keeping for us also. So something like that would fall under on-call GIS services, whereas the lead and copper rule, it's a separate entity from our on-call services. It is the same system and it is being managed by the same H H2M, same vendor. Okay. It'd be interesting to see what our, our budget is with H2M for annually, which... I guess Irene would have and, and you'll have. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get that information over here. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily interesting as much as it is. Are we outsourcing work that we could possibly do in-house if we had an additional person? Yeah. It's sort of like in the situation where you continually pay staff overtime instead of hiring another person. To fill that slot. Yeah. So the question that I'm going to ask you is that when you do your calculations, can you also give us a factor as to what is the level of complexity of the tasks that they are being given? And would we be consistent in doing it in-house instead of paying probably a premium to have it go outside? Yeah. And, I, and I'd extend that. Can you give us three years worth of data? Uh, yes, and I don't see why we couldn't do that. Thank you. Um, Broken I, out, please. I can say for the items that are on the agenda are, are the items that we would not be able to do in-house. Uh, some Most of these items require considerate, a considerable amount of effort for design um, or research that go into it that we don't have that yeah. Capability but for. no, but but to Trustee Torino's comment, and believe me, my uh, my company we're dealing with right now, we have a couple of groups that have uh, chosen to very thinly staff themselves. We've relied upon external contractors to kind of help us. Now we're trying to get away from that because it does become a very significant cost differential between in-house versus outside outside staff, and now we're finding ourselves being deficient with people with that skill set. So agreed, there may be some high-end design stuff where we where it it pays for us to be able to cherry pick people that have those skills. But I would bet that if we look at all of this stuff, it may benefit us to have a person or two people on staff. We can build the institutional knowledge that we can then continue to grow the grow our capabilities. Absolutely understood. Thank you. And we just brought in someone who's like an expert in the field. We have a new head of the water department. So yes. Which is a good starting point. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, Mr. Giovanelli. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. The building department has one item on the agenda tonight, and that item is under the finance department, item number 1A, and that's for a transfer of uh, funds from for $40,000 to safety inspections due to the Tyler software implementation. Tyler, Soft, uh, 
Tyler Capital, Pro it's a capital project and we're increasing the capital project by an additional $40,000, which will bring this capital project to 279,894. Uh, the reason being for this transfer is some outstanding invoices, uh, overruns on the implementation due to um, reports, reporting and different um, reports and strategies that the building department needs. So there was a, a little bit of an overrun. Um, this will bring that project up to an additional $40,000. Um, that is the only item the building department has on the agenda. Um, I do have an um, update on the senior center flooring. We met with the uh, contractor on Tuesday. Um, we identified the problem as far as why the floor is buckling. We've um, came up, up with a solution and the contractor will be on site on uh, on the 10th of June to rem try to remedy that flooring. Uh, it's gonna may take a few days for the floor to settle um, as the floor lifted. Um, so I, that's gonna just take its course. Um, Mayor, in Ralph's absence, I'd like to uh, brief the board on a few of his comments. If you'd like me to do that now, I can. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. All right, so item number three, first item is item number three, and that's the under the human resources. Item number three is the annual affordable act, and it's a ACA employee agreement on ADP. The board authorization is, requ is requested to approve the contracting with ADP, our current vendor, for an additional module. It's at an annual cost of approximately forty to $4,200. The village previously contracts a third-party vendor, Alibra Group, for fifteen thousand five hundred as an annual fee um, for the ACA compliance services. Since the village already all uses and utilizes the ADP for payroll and human resource tasks, this is an additional module which will which will all which will, which will bring the village into compliance with ACA filings. This is a function and a cost of the outside services. So the village council it was already approved this form. And we got here. So this is going to be this is a reduction of the cost for the um, recently administered. It's, it's coming out of the fiscal year of the administrative budget of the 23-24. All right. So that's the. First item, the second item is item number five, and that is for the office construction, administrative and finance transfer of funds uh, for IntelliTech services. The board authorization is requested for a $50,000 um, close for the, rec for the recreation dog park capital project to the office construction, administrative finance capital project. Board authorization is requested to approve the following proposal for IntelliTech services. And this is for the installation of non-electrified locks for the business office. Business office. This will include also additional installation for the electrified locks for the for doors, and the also include wiring for the control panel for for the um, basement computer room at a, at a cost of ten thousand seven thirty one sixty four for the for the computer room and the cost for the electrified locks is 28,572.97 dollars and for the installation of the non-electrified locks is 10,366.63. Okay, the um the sixth item on the agenda is the computer room restoration. This is the approval for IntelliTech. And this is basically granting the, the approval for IntelliTech to provide these services for the switch racks, to, to mount switch racks for the fiber optic cables in the basement computer room. Um, this basically um, is, is patch panels for the computer room to the racks as far as switchboards and, and UPS backups. And that's a cost of 10,244.59. In summary, for that item, is the installation will streamline um, connectivity from the from the computers, the applications for the business office, 
and the and the communications for the IT services um, and the networking, f faster networking and easy to for troubleshooting. And IntelliTech is on the, the New York State uh, competitive bid uh, contract, and they've done work in the village fire. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have here? Okay, so that was the agenda items. John covered the masonry repairs and, and roofing for the library. So Ralph just wanted me to give an update on the community benefit fund. And so the, the um, community benefit fund applications, there were three new community benefit fund applications were submitted to the Long Island Railroad and all three had been approved. The, fir the first community benefit fund was for 875,000 which covered the cost of the road drainage improvements on Maryland Avenue. The actual cost reimbursed, the actual cost that we reimbursed was $856,903.12. Trustee Wu is in the process of obtaining the reimbursement packages for submission to Long Island Railroad for this amount. The second community benefit fund was approved for the landscaping was $200,000. And the third was the 75 additional uh, respectively additional funding to come to for the landscaping of 275,000 which reimbursed was will be in reimbursed to the village for the actual amount of $268,550 uh the other thing the other thing on the lastly on the account on the agenda for, for Mr. Swazi was the you, you the board had asked him to set up a meeting with Adelphi University uh to talk about um uh, reimbursements uh, and 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 the uh, basically he reached out to the, the leadership and the team and there's a meeting scheduled to take place on June 15th and that's all I have Mayor. thank you if you thank can you. Um, also share at the meet and greet earlier in the week questions were asked about the um, western section firehouse and I know we had a meeting since then um, some of us with you if you want to just share uh, where we're at in that process so we had a meeting this afternoon. There was a project that was updated and schematic plans were submitted uh, by the structural engineer and the architect. And we had a meeting this afternoon to discuss the pr progression of, of, of the staging of that project. Uh, we, we walked through the building. Um, basically now it's a matter of the chiefs if it's, if it's gonna be sufficient for them as far as design. Once that design is approved, we can go back to the architects and the structural engineer, and they can start preparing the final documents that to go out to bid so we can get some pricing and, and bidding on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Well, there's still some other items in the community benefit fund which we'll apply for if we get approval for them. Uh, there's some discussion we've had with the Yes, there's, there's a few. The last we have those three approved. Right. Yeah. Just have a question for you. Um, the Tyler software piece, the extra 40 grand, what does it bring the total cost to again? 279, 279, give me one second. Okay. So, and you're saying that this is work, uh, question, is this a, an issue of scope creep? Is this stuff that requirements that were missed by us or by the folks who came in and did the work? What do we think the driver is? The total amount is 279,894. This is scope of increase. Uh, the scope increased for services that they provided to us. Um, some of them are outstanding that needs to be paid, and some are future invoices that probably be sent over. No, but hold on. My question is this. Is this scope that we're asking for that yes. we missed, or is it scope that they're suggesting for us? No, there's, this is scope that was rendered. I'm scope, sorry, sco yeah. scope that was needed and requested, yes. But did we but did we miss it as part of the original? Because what I'm trying to understand here is this. I'm assuming we sat down with them and said, look, we need you to do these 10 tasks for us, right? And they're doing the 10 and we agreed the 10 tasks, the simplistic example. As you go on, we might miss one or two tasks and no right. blood, no foul. My question is, is it, you know, adding 40,000. So this was originally, it was what, 230 and change, right? You're looking at going up almost 20%, right? On, on, on the number, is that being driven by our ask for stuff that we missed or stuff that they're suggesting to us? Stuff that we are asking for. So yes. we just, so we missed it as part of the first go around. Well, yeah, it's not that we missed it. We, they misin misinformed us as far as, as how the system works. So now we have to ask these questions and now we're trying to get the best out of the product. So is it stuff that we were not 
told. So when they were doing a demo of the software, they missed it. Right, they missed how they missed how to in, to interpret the software to us. So we're in, we are asking for additional items to be made. So by asking for additional items, there's an increase in cost. Oh no, no question. But my 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 point is very simply: should they have shown it to us? If if it if it was something that they should have shown to us as part of the demo, then it should have been part of the original requirements. So we shouldn't be surprised by an extra forty grand. And that's my thing: is that unfortunately, I've seen many software companies out there, and I'm not suggesting these guys do it you basically only show two or three things and then guess what as you get into the software it becomes and and we award them a bid because the cost is cheap and the time is fast and then over time we then realize oh well we need another one of these another one of these another of these right. and then guess what the cost starts mm -hmm. to balloon it's not a happy moment believe me excuse me <laughs> it's not a happy moment believe me that we have to ask for additional funds but it's needed for the software unfortunately okay thank you any other questions uh, Giuseppe, you said that John talked about number 19, the masonry. Makes you repair a roof at the library, yes. Uh, I guess I just missed that when you talked about it. Okay. What's, so what's the question? That's an award of a bid to a low bidder. Is this in connection with or separate from the whole children's thing? It's It's separate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I'm sorry, Mayor. I just want to clarify something. Giuseppe's item with the $40,000 transfer, I just want you to realize that the first is going to be approving, increasing the capital project by 40000 40, I, I stated that. Yeah, I know, but they have to know that that's going to be in the minutes that they're going to vote yep. on increasing the capital project first and then transferring the funds. I just want you all to be clear that you're voting on. It's not on the agenda because finance pointed it out to... Um, Ralph and Giuseppe and I during the week. I'm sorry. So if you can just. It's, an, it's is, increasing the capital project. You're voting to increase the capital project by what is the exact amount? 40. 40,000. Exactly 40,000. It's, it's, it's 40,000. There is, there is 552.4903 in the budget right now, but we're increasing it by 40,000, which will bring us up to 279.894. I just wanted you all to be aware that it was an increase in the capital project and then the transfer funds. All right. So that'll when be reflected we go to approve, in the, yeah. I'm going to have to amend. So it will be board authorization to increase capital projects. It's exactly 40,000, Giuseppe? From what yes. to what? And what's the name of the capital project? This is uh, the software implementation, software replacement, I'm sorry, software replacement for the building department. Actually, I think it's, yeah, the transfer, you have $5,249.03 yes. already. Yes. Well, the transfer is 40000 Right. I just wanted to be clear, um, Giuseppe, I didn't mean to step on you. No, no, absolutely. Thank you. Just for the minutes. Yeah, it's for the increase. And so the, the board of trustees realizes policy. that it's two actions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Brownie? Thank you. All right, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, trustees and residents. Recreation has two items on the agenda this evening. First is number seven, which relates to repairs to the St. Paul's Fieldhouse. And discussing this with Treasurer Wu, uh, it is a four-step process. Number one, board authorization is requested to Establish an additional capital project budget in the amount of $58,800 for St. Paul's Fieldhouse roof repairs. Authorization is then requested to appropriate $58,800 of ARPA funds for the work needed for these repairs. Third, board authorization is requested to declare an emergency situation so as to necessitate the awarding of a contract without going through competitive bidding to repair the St. Paul's Fieldhouse roof repairs which was damaged by recent rainstorms. And fourth, board authorization is requested to engage preferred exterior roofing and siding of New Hyde Park to make repairs to the field house roof at a cost of $58,800. Should be noted that we did go out and get three proposals for this project, and they were 58,800 from preferred, 
and 64,000 from vendor number two and $73,410 from vendor number three. Uh, the other item on the agenda this evening is award of bid number 17, assorted clothing. And this is for t-shirts, uh, golf shirts, sweatshirts uh, for the part-time staff in the recreation parks departments. And this is a uh, renewal option for one year from Empire Printing LLC. They are willing to extend last year's prices for another season for us. And uh, we recommend that we accept this. That's all we have on the agenda this evening. Uh, one note, the pool is getting close to opening. We'll be ready on June 10th. Both pools are filled and operating and everything is looking good. The planting is proceeding nicely. And I think people will have a, a nice facility when we open it up at noon on Saturday, June 10th. And if you can all pray for nice sunny weather for the rest of the week, I would deeply appreciate it. Trustee question. Yeah. After Charlie. It's a little confusing um, to me, perhaps to no one else, but why are we awarding seven, number seven without competitive bidding if we did do competitive bidding and they were the low bidder? Well, we did an RFP, not competitive bidding. We did not go out for a public bid. If we did that, a public bid at best is going to take eight to 10 weeks to have awarded. In that time, we're concerned that the damage will become worse. And it won't only be the roof that gets damaged, but the synthetic floor inside the field house, which does not tolerate being flooded by water. Um, John Baroni was nice enough to send village engineer Craig Bandini up on the roof on Tuesday. And he did report back that, in his opinion, it was an emergency situation and needed to be addressed as soon as possible. This is a matter of expediency, but we always do our due diligence and get additional prices. Now, in terms of the RFPs, mm -hmm. are, does it indicate on the RFP that this may, due to circumstances that are unknown at this time, be converted into a sole source and awarded without competitive bidding? It would be very difficult to make this a sole source. To be a true sole source, the vendor or the product has to be completely and totally unavailable elsewhere. So it would be difficult to say that this is the only company that could repair this roof. And that probably is not the way to go on this. Okay, well, putting, a, putting aside the semantics, in terms of an RFP, are the people who get it told that this might be your response may be considered if it goes to emergency and we award it that way. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sir, a couple quick questions. Have we, uh, have we engaged, uh, this might be better for um, Mr. Giuseppe here, have we, have we engaged preferred exterior roofing before? We have, we've used them uh, in the past. They were the firm that did the re-roofing of the shade structure down by the main pool last spring. Uh, they performed in a workmanlike manner. They came in, they were efficient, they were clean, they did a nice job, and um, they were one of our better vendors. I just want to also mention that if this thing happened to go to a bid, it can also be prices will increase because it's due to insurance purposes and everything else. So the prices could be 10 to 20% more than what we have here. Uh, follow up, uh, Mr. Blake, uh, how does the rest of the roof look? The rest of the roof is going to be needing attention in the future, but all three of the vendors that came in said that we did not have to consider a full roof repair for another two to three years. So that will be appearing on our capital budget next year. You'll see that a couple of years out. And uh, in today's dollars, the estimates were between five and 600,000 to completely replace the barrel roof on the building. Thank you. And then one final uh, issue on, on related to uh, to the St. Paul's Fieldhouse are uh, my good friends at Conkel. Um, and I, I say that, um, that tongue in cheek. Um, I, I was in town and I, I sent some pictures to Paul and um, have not been impressed with their services for, for a long time. And I know that you have ridden herd on them, but I'm a little concerned that that, that what I saw is more indicative of, of what happens across the village than, than it should. This, um, what Trustee Finneran is referring to is the habit that they occasionally fall into of running their lawnmowers over all the trash in the world and shredding it up into little pieces, which are very difficult to pick up. We worked on this with them quite diligently last summer, and they got out of that habit, and they were actually picking the trash up. 
Uh, I had a long conversation with Mr. Power, the owner of Concal yesterday, and I impressed upon him the need to go back to last year's standards. Um, my instinct is that I made a good impression and let's see what happens in the coming weeks. Excellent. And are, are we year to year with them? This is the final year of their contract. They were, um, they were basically a three-year contract. So we will be going out to rebid uh, this project over the winter. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions? The only question for Paul is the playground equipment looks great. <laughs> you may want to go sing that praise. The uh, St. Paul's. Yeah, we, uh, if, for those of you that haven't seen it, uh, we recently installed a new safety surface, which is the synthetic turf that we used over at Edgemere Park which has uh, received rave reviews and it goes very well with the playground equipment and uh, the shade structure should be up very shortly. We had a, a piece of it that was damaged in transit and we're waiting for a replacement part, but the playground looks really good. And um, the next playground that we'll be getting that surface is going to be Nassau Haven. And we actually have a meeting with the vendor tomorrow to start developing the plans and specs. So we're slowly but surely bringing all of the playgrounds back up to the standards that we've always had in the past. It's been a while, but we're getting there. What, what's the latest on the tree situation in town, either putting new ones in or taking out the dead ones and things like that, Paul? We continue to take out uh, dead trees. Um, we get a lot of resident phone calls now about ash trees, which looked good last year, but now don't look so good this year. Um, we've probably taken out another 40 ash trees since the contract are left in early spring. Uh, we have a list down at the uh, the yard that's probably, I think there's about 15 trees on it right now that have been reported. And Do still plan to close those small fields on Stewart Avenue and two of the larger fields and get to work on them. Um, on that item of fields, I was over at Nassau Haven today. We closed that field earlier this spring due to uh, complaints about the lack of grass. And I'm pleased to report that the grass is growing very nicely over there. We also took, uh, for us, an unusual step. We didn't cut the grass this week at St. Paul's. There were no games. So we decided let's let it grow, get a little healthier before we chop it down. So we're we're working diligently on trying to improve the condition of the fields, and we are starting to see results. Thank you. It sounds like no mow men. <laughs> Which, by the way, is now being touted as something you should not do. Uh, the problem with no mow may is your grass gets nice and tall, and all of these butterflies and little bees and everything live in it. And then you come out with a lawnmower and you chop it down, and during your first cut, you kill them all. So that's not a good thing. Um, the other issue is that when the grass gets too tall, it can provide shelter for weeds and for diseases that creep into the shadows that don't get hit by the sun. And most people, when they cut the lawn, again, you're going to let it grow for a month. It's going to grow to eight inches tall. And you're going to come out with your lawnmower. You're going to chop it down to two inches. You're going to kill all the grass. You're supposed to take it down a third of the blade at a time. So if you no mow may, it's going to take till August before you can get that grass back down to a manageable two inches. So it's it's a nice concept. It has nice, you know, warm and fuzzy about it, but it may not be the most effective thing you can do for your lawn. Well, it's June, so that crisis has passed. Thank heavens. But thank you for the information on that. Well, Paul, uh, one question. Actually, two questions. Um, 
you know, just looking at the field over there, it, it, growing the grass is going to be, you know, that's definitely the positive. But there's a lot of weeds. Like, have you made any progress with the weeds? Because the weeds seem to be you know, kind of really running rampant. The the weeds are, are going to be a, a problem uh, until the organic program really takes hold because we, we don't use any weed killer. Um, the theory is at this point, if it's green, it's good. Um, the, the As the grass grows and as it develops better roots and starts to become thicker, it will start to choke the weeds out. But that's something that only occurs over time. There's no quick fix for getting rid of the weeds and the clover unless we want to go back to putting pesticides on the field. And I, I don't really think we want to do that. Right. So so what 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 is the time frame? So what, what can we expect to see in the fall, for instance? I, I, I can't say when the weeds are going to start choking out. We were we were initially told, and the rule of thumb is anywhere between three and five years to see improvement in the turf. We're just putting down the fourth year applications now. So we hopefully will see some improvement in the quality of the grass and a diminishing of the weeds over the next 12 to 18 months. Great. Uh, last question. So um, you, I know we've been talking about taking the fields out of service, but it sounds like we're not taking all the fields out of service. No. That some will, some will, re which fields will remain? Um, be well, right now, I believe the plan is to take out the small fields on Stewart Avenue, the ones we call the window fields, and two large fields that are directly to the west of the comfort station. Those are the ones that are um, in most need of rest. And we have areas up in the northeast corner of the field that we have not striped for fields for a while. So we're going to put some fields up there. Um, that's the plan right now. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Blake. You're welcome. Commissioner Jackson. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, item number four on the agenda. Officer Gunnels has already been to two uh, major steps in being a commercial vehicle inspector. He's uh, he did the first two phases of the North American standard in commercial vehicle inspections. Now we're asking for border authorization to send him to Albany, New York, for general hazardous materials. It, it sounds really like general, but it's not. It's 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 a very important step uh, when you're a ve uh, commercial vehicle inspector. Uh, you you know the first two phases you're going through the 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 building of the truck and the mechanics of the truck and the wheels and the weight and everything else. Now is the hazard materials, what they're carrying. So that is a very important phase. And he's going to be going over the hazard material shipping requirements, the material regulations, the inspection guidelines, uh, roadside inspections, also business inspections. He'll, he'll be able to uh, check paperwork and then he'll do practical exercises. This training is, uh, there's no cost to this training. We just have to pay for uh, lodging and fuel. But I'm asking for this. Uh, this is a very important um, step for us because our senior officer in the truck inspection unit is uh, has, has many years. He may be retiring in, in the near future. So this will be a continual standard of uh, strict commercial vehicle enforcement in the village. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Chief Kern. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. The fire department has nothing on the formal agenda. However, I'd just like to keep everybody apprised of our uh, month of May stats. The fire department responded to 85 total alarms, 78 of which were our signal eights, our lesser alarms, automatic fire alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, one general alarm, two extrication calls, and four mutual aid calls to surrounding departments. Um, and just a friendly piece of advice for all the residents. It is barbecue season. We all enjoy it. However, we do ask residents to take extra care when uh, grilling at home. Please move all grills away from the house, as well as all overhangs, whether they be decks, awnings, or any natural ones, including trees and branches. And please secure all the fuel sources once complete. Other than that, I'd be happy to help uh, excuse me, answer any questions anyone may have. Any questions? All right, none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is Ms. Wu on Zoom? No, she's not. Okay. All right, Council. I have Sorry. nothing on the agenda for tonight. Thank you. Mayor, if I could uh, just ask uh, the Chief a, a question or com Commissioner. Uh, things seem to have been active over the last month in the village how would you characterize how things are going speeding wise and other infractions and uh, you know we had i know we had a couple of cars broken into etc okay um with speed enforcement i don't have the exact numbers yet because it's, it's still coming in but with speed enforcement uh 
I know we're over 5,000 tickets for the year already. Uh, so we are uh, continuing our strict enforcement. Uh, and that's all violations because I know we have concerns not just for speeding. We have concerns for noise and and red lights and stop signs. And uh, again, 96 miles of roadways, and we're trying to cover as much as we can. Um, we did have some incidents in the east. Um, we had uh, one car stolen, and we had uh, several cars broken in the northeast section. We also had some burglaries in the southeast section. Uh, we have some evidence. Uh, we're waiting for some results on that. Uh, we are also working with Nassau County. Uh, they're detectives who have had similar instances. Um, there's been some um, burglary activity north of us again, uh, so we're watching that. And uh, the, there was also one uh, arrest of um, a group from Argentina that uh, is involved in burglary. So we're hoping that helps us too. Uh, but we are still working on uh, what uh, we have extra patrols we put out there, and uh, we're hoping to come close with those people. Excellent. Just um, as a point of in information, what does... Um... What does Officer Riley do on on the first day in his first few months? How was he incorporated into the into the team? You're talking about uh, all, oh, yeah, the, the academy? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, he's still there. He's not. Yeah. So no, he's not a he's not a New York City officer. He goes to the academy, and the and the academy starts from day one. You, you know, it goes into a paramilitary uh, aspect. Uh, he gets yelled at a lot uh, in the academy. Um, he has to be. Uh, he has to meet physical standards, educational standards. And uh, he goes through a lot of social aspects that's now in the modern policing world. Uh, and then when he comes out uh, at the end of his training, he's still technically in the academy. He'll be assigned to a police officer. We have one uh, assigned to a police officer now. He's graduating next week. This officer is now taking that uh, same mantle and he's going forward. So we'll have one officer come out uh, next week and he'll be ready to join the patrol force because he already had his field training. Yeah. And then uh, we have to we have to have certified officers of the department. We have to have the specially trained so they can be part of New York State because everything is New York State certification. And you have to go. You have to be uh, certified and meet their specifications. Oral uh, training officers have that. So uh, it's usually a smooth transition. But uh, he's going to be there about seven months, six to six to seven months. But well, when he comes out, I'll be fully trained and ready to go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any other questions? All right. Um, just a few um, comments. I wanted to make one thing, the annual water quality report. Everyone should have received it by now. Um, and the EAB um, will be holding a meeting on water to go over the water report and everything that's going on in the village. We will have... Um, you know, the mention of staffing on March 21st, Dan Carey joined the village as the water department superintendent. Um, he's worked in the water industry for 38 years. He's the former superintendent at Massapequa Water District and director of distribution at Suffolk County Water Authority. He also sits in the New York State Drinking Water Quality Council, appointed by the governor. And he's past chairman of both the Long Island Water Conference and Long Island Commission of Aquifer Protection. So he's a you know great addition here uh, on the topic of water, which is one of you know concern for so many residents. So um, Trustee Harrington and I are excited to have that meeting and give residents an opportunity to hear more about the water and the water report they received. The gas-powered leaf blower ban went into effect Memorial Day weekend, and it will be in effect through Labor Day weekend. The village is sending out a letter. It's my hope that we're not going to have to, you know, waste our resources, police officers ticketing, um, residents calling on their neighbors. I'm already hearing those complaints. We're sending a very clear letter to the landscapers. We now have all of their contact information we have, I believe it's 160 landscapers licensed for the village. So um, they're all being told clearly. And it is my hope that they just follow the rule and that we don't end up with um, any you know, need for uh, the using our resources on that. Um, the next thing I wanted to, I'm excited about the Belmont Festival and um, Wanted to let people know the village is doing a proclamation. If you did not know, the jockey who won the Kentucky Derby is a village resident, um, Javier Castellano. He's been a resident for 20 years. Um, his children are in the schools here, and he is going to be honored at, and Mr. Wilton just joined. We're working together on um, a little ceremony. Well, he'll be honored at the Belmont Festival. So should be a great night and hope everyone comes out for that. 
Um, do any trustees have comments? I just want to comment. Um, I think many of you know Paul Rothenbiller. He's done a lot of work for the Villas these past two years uh, with the Main Avenue Project and really supervising uh, the planting uh, from Sweet Hollow along Green Ridge Avenue, Main Avenue, around the station in Strawberry Field. His wife of 56 years, uh, Barry Ann, passed away a couple of days ago. I want to thank the trustees that, uh, on behalf of Paul, I want to thank the trustees that came to the wake this afternoon and to the village employees that came. Paul really appreciated that, and I want to thank you very much. Thank trustee you. Collins. I wanted to thank John and uh, Commissioner Jackson for all their help on the traffic issues and the requests that keep coming in. So thank you both for that. And I think we're expecting a report um, coming soon on the traffic calming study results. So thank you. Yes. Uh, um, Chairman Trustee Kelly, who's the two, chairman of the Traffic Commission on uh, all weeks. the work. Yes, at the next meeting. I did have one uh, quick question uh, for Charlie, uh, Trustee Kelly, or Mr. Baroni regarding the uh, the truck ban and where that is. Is that in the uh, is that in the county's pocket right now or in uh, on their agenda? Uh, that, that's correct. So we came we came up with a draft plan on side placement. Some of those sides need to be placed in county right of way and Mineola right of way. So we're waiting for approval from county and Mineola to place the correct signage. Do you expect, uh, Mr. Baroni, that to take the the requisite amount of time that we've experienced in the past, or can we put a little heat on them? Would I would do, do my think? best to turn up the flame? Thank you, sir. I think that'll be a quicker turnaround than some of the things. All right. So we don't have any other comments from the trustees. I'll open it up for citizens' comment on agenda items, and I'll begin with the <laughs> residents in the audience. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Robert Vesselotti, 32 Brixton Road. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. I second the comments that Mr. Chester made on Bruce and his service and, and the loss of his wife. And it was very sad. I was over there this afternoon myself and knew all of the his wife and his her, her sisters, you know, four girls. Anyway, um, so um, I know Paul might have had a couple of questions on the landscaping. So I guess I'll just raise it for, for Paul. Um, so on the main avenue, number 18, uh, first of all, thank you for pursuing those funds from the community fund and hearing that we're being reimbursed is terrific from the railroad. So kudos to everyone that was involved in that because it's nice to get some money back in the till. Um, but, uh, you know, having not having Sweet Hollow anymore, who did a great job, and um, now we have Coastal and, um, I'm just not sure, you know, I know we go for the lowest bidders and that's how it works, but just for kicks, I checked out their website and I'll be honest with you, I didn't see any landscaping on the website. It was just a little strange. Now, maybe they don't maintain a good website. Maybe they're not putting in a lot of images or projects that they're doing, but I will say that I'm a little concerned because you just don't see the work that they've done in other locations. So I'm also curious, you know, not having seen the plan, if our plan for the landscaping is on our website or if it is public where we can see what's planned uh, to go in. Uh, so I'd love to you know, see the plan, number one. And I'd also like to know, you know how capable Coastal is because again, if you look at the website, it's a little land and not much there to see. So I just would wanna know if we could see the plan so, so I know what we're getting and then, uh, Curious about their capabilities. Also, a pretty new company, from what I understand. Do you want to respond on the? So, uh, coastal contracting. We checked their references. Uh, they came highly recommended. Um, I would right. definitely recommend the award to them. Okay, good. As long, that's that's good to know. Um, but uh, you know, maybe they should show some of their work. It would be nice because I'm serious. You go there and it's just 
okay. <laughs> well, there's nothing to look at. Sure, we can work on it. Yeah. Okay. So now is the plan available for us to see as or far as you know what the landscaping plan is? You know, um I'll, turn, I'll turn that back over to the board. I'm sorry. Yeah, the plan we can make available. I don't think it is right now. I know the number of trees and the and the and the uh, quality of the of the trees is right. is, is been listed, but I, I don't think an actual plan has been put up yet. But we can we can get that. Okay, and then the only other question is: We're talking about a much smaller area than what we had to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when you Green Ridge and Strawberry Field. Yes, but I'm also curious if there's going to be any planting on the north of the roadway, which is actually the railroad property. I mean, are we allowed to plant there? Are we planning to plant? We're there? very limited there. I mean, you saw the little plants that they put yes. down. It's yes. very frustrating. Yes, but I just don't know if our landscaping plan will move on to their property or if they're giving us permission to plant on their property or if we can convince them to plant on that property but that's the property that's very devoid of planting obviously we can plant on the islands and other things but well, i'm just concerned that. about whether or not we can actually plant on their property we're hoping that the island planting kind of covers the station as best we can um and then we will obviously ask them to plant a little bit better than what they've planted um any discussions with them is always difficult as you know right so we will ask for that but the purpose of the planting on the islands and the whole purpose of the project as you know too is to try to cover the yes. station and uh and the, and the lighting that's coming from there right and it's Thank also you. we've been asking for the baffles and that's for further discussion I guess. right so the last thing i wanted to comment on was was um that i heard you know, through one of the workers, there was several Long Island workers on the platforms the other day, all Long Island Railroad fellows. And um, they said that the main contractor is no longer working on that project and that the railroad themselves is trying to finish all the punch list items on Maryland Station and other stations. Um, there must have been 10 or 12 railroad engineer type fellows up there taking notes and, and, um, Punch when you, list notes when you and, say and, and, and I'm, I'm just hearing through the grapevine that they're saying that the contractor no longer is finishing the project that they're trying to pick up the loose ends and finish what needs they're to be done. saying that 3tc is not i don't know project. if it's 3tc they're referring well, 3TC to is the or main the contract. i think Del, delgado or whoever they were yeah. originally they 3tc is the main contractor and they use their subcontract as a, you know as you know right. electric ej electric and various right. other ones so I mean, I'll check with Alan. Yeah, I'm just curious, you know, yeah. who's who's going to finish, you know, okay. because there's lots to finish still. Okay, so I'll check with Alan. Pascoe it would be good to know. Yeah, absolutely. thanks a lot. Well, anyway, I appreciate the uh, feedback on the landscaping. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Oro. Kathleen Oro for Maryland Avenue, um, continuing what Mr. Vasileva was saying. Um, this just says number 18 Main Avenue landscaping. I'm more concerned with Maryland Avenue landscaping or the lack of. Um, the bushes, you know, are still about that high. Are we going to get anything higher? Do you know anything about it? And my other question is, um, they still, Across from my house, um, the orange webbing kind of fencing, when is that ever going to be completed and taken down? Well, that's going to be taken down, and we're hoping to get the panels to cover the bottom of the platform. Like, it's open. You can see underneath it. So we're hoping to get those panels put in and that orange stuff take it away. I mean, the project is not done yet. So, right. Mr. And Vassilotti then, asked a question about, is there a different contractor on it? I hadn't heard that, but I'll contact Alan Pasco up unless, John, you know anything more or Giuseppe? Okay, okay. Actually, Ralph Swazi couldn't be here tonight, but I know he has a meeting scheduled next week, and he really would be in the best position, I think, to field some of these questions. So we can get back to you on these particular questions, because I think he would probably have them easily at hand, and he has a, a meeting scheduled next week right. on wrapping up the loose ends we've been talking about. And just one more loose end that hopefully is wrapped up eventually, the porto potty 
that I look at 24 <laughs> seven since way before Christmas, because I was tempted to put a Christmas red bow on it. And then I couldn't figure out how to stick it without using super glue. And I didn't want to get into serious trouble on that one. Um, but every once in a while, I notice it's just not the railroad employees are now using it. Right. So I don't want people to think it is just, you know, a WC for everybody's use. We'll yeah. put that on the list. Yes. Absolutely. No one yes. wants to pour a potty there no. any longer. Yeah, we will. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Any other resident comments on agenda items in the room? Anyone on Zoom with a resident comment on agenda items? Okay. No questions. All right, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from the May 18th, 2023 meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes. Um, moving on to the formal agenda. I have some appointments. Um, I am proposing Allison Parks of 106 Wyatt Road as a member of the Environmental Advisory Board for a term to expire um, for 626. Um, do I have a motion to approve her appointment? I'll make a motion. She be approved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Um, I also am proposing the appointment of Kurt Eric of 80 Westminster Road as a member of the Environmental Advisory Board for a term to expire April 5th, 2027. Do I have a motion to approve, uh, approve this appointment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I am proposing appointment of Richard Williams of 411 Stewart Avenue as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals for a term to expire April 3rd, 2008. Do I have a motion? I'm sorry, 2028. 20. Do I have a motion to approve this appointment? I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. I'm proposing Rod Coyne of appointment of Rod Coyne of 28 Franklin Court as a member of the Board of Ethics for a three-year term to expire April 6, 2026. Do I have a motion to approve this appointment? Can I have a point of order first? And there is, at least in my view, and I have not seen anything to the contrary, that the appointment, the initial appointment of the individuals on the Board of Ethics, according to village law, is for a three-year term. And accordingly, that term does not expire on the date. Now, I know that item number five involves my son. But the fact of the matter is, when he took the oath of office, it was for a three-year term. And therefore, it is of my opinion that legally those positions are not vacant. All right. So I did discuss this with counsel. It was raised previously. and with our um, village clerk and the last appointments for the um, Board of Ethics were one year terms. For some reason, all three individuals were appointed for one year terms. Those terms have all expired. So I will also by way of explanation and discussing um, with village council as well, the idea of the three year terms, I think there's a benefit to the village to having continuity and not having any board turnover entirely at one time. So for that reason, in making these appointments, you'll see that I am proposing a one-year term, a two-year term, and a three-year term so that each year we will have, they'll be staggered and we'll have um, a new appointment with each year. So that is the reason that I'm doing the appointments. And as far as the issue that you're raising, it's um, the information I've been provided is a one-year term, so. Well. The difficulty is that the village law says the position is a three-year term. And therefore, if the law, so if there may be a ministerial error, that does not trump a law. Okay. Accordingly, it is still my position that the positions are not vacant. Thank you. Um, having consulted with council, I've been advised otherwise, and I'd like to feel, I think it's important that we have a board of ethics and that's why I'm taking this step. So, um, any other comments? Do I have a motion to approve the appointment then of Rod Coyne for the 
three-year term to the Board of Ethics to expire April 6, 2026. So we have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. So that's 7-1. Um, I am proposing the appointment of Kimberly Johnson Glenn of 115 Locust Street as a member of the Board of Ethics for a two-year term to expire April 7th, 2025. Do I have a motion to approve that appointment? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay, so seven in favor, one abstention. Uh, and um, I am proposing reappointment of Rich Correa of 197 Meadbrook Road as a member of the Board of Ethics for a one year term to expire April 1st, 2024. Do I have a motion to approve that appointment? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? One opposed, six in favor. Okay, two to six. So we'll move now to the consent calendar. I just wanted to say that I was chairman of the Board of Ethics and I worked with both Allison Metzler and Ryan Torino, and they did excellent work with me, and I wanted to thank them for their work for the village on the Board of Ethics. Thank you. I'll join in, in thanking the residents for their service on the Board of Ethics and also for the service of the other individuals who are um, have served on the zoning board. Uh, the e and the EAB. All right, so on the consent calendar, there are two items that will need clarification for the vote. Um, number one, we are adding the language, the board to authorize increase of the software replacement capital project for the building department to do we have the dollar amount? Okay. To two hundred and seventy nine thousand eight hundred and ninety four dollars. And in item number seven, um I am adding uh, the language and this relates to the um engagement for the roofing uh, project repair uh, at St. Paul's, that this is being done because of the presence of a leak and the risk of substantial damage. All right, so do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar with the addition of language in number one of the board to authorize increase of the software replacement capital project for the building department to $279,894? and the addition of language on number seven to include, um, this is being done because of, uh, because the presence of a leak and the risk of substantial damage. So is there a motion to approve the consent calendar with those additions? So moved. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so one um, communications issue, The uh, I'll just note that what we just passed includes the uh, homecoming parade, which will be October 14th at one o'clock. I'll now open it up for citizens comments on non-agenda items. Anyone in the room with a citizen comment? Mr. Stimler? Leo Stimler, 67 Huntington Road. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the disappointment that I experienced at the legislative hearing for the Casino Sands and the disappointment um, that some of the biggest failures I thought of that hearing were not covered by Newsday. And I'd like to give a couple of examples. Um, mayor, you spoke with the mayor of uh, Westbury and the mayor of... Um, uh, Mineola, and you all spoke against the Casino Sands 
It wasn't covered in Newstag, as you pointed out. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Chester, you mentioned that when you were making your remarks a Monday ago, that we had waited, those who wanted to speak against the casino, waited two hours. And um, at shortly after four o'clock, the, the presiding supervisor said there would be abbreviated, that's the word he used, abbreviated remarks from the Casino Sands organization. We waited over two hours. Uh, that was wrong. Newsday didn't cover that either. Um, Trustee Finneran, you mentioned um, that a lot of money is being thrown around. Uh, one of the things that I didn't like, I never heard David Patterson referred to as anything except the governor. Now, maybe I missed it. I never heard him referred to as the vice president of Casino Sands. As far as I know, uh, and I'm not certain of this, but as far as I know from newspaper reports, that's still true. He's still the vice president at Casino Sands. That's a lot of money being thrown out. And if you notice, and, and, and maybe I'm nitpicking here, but look where he sat. He didn't sit with the other Casino Sands executives inside the gate. It looked like it appeared as though he was speaking as a public citizen, as the former governor of New York. And, and he, I never heard, unless I missed it, because sometimes it was noisy, I never heard him referred to as anything except Governor Patterson, which of course he is, but he's also vice president of Casino Sands, or at least he was. And there's more of that money being thrown out. I'm sure that he got a good salary. The other thing that, that bothered me was the chief executive of um, Family and Ch Children's Services. Um, he sounded like a lobbyist. I don't know if he's a lobbyist. I don't know if he was paid. I don't know if he was promised, but he talked about meetings. He's been meeting with Casino Sands, uh, with Sands Casino. So what were you meeting about? Well, he talked about, we've been meeting about a partnership. Well, are you being paid for that partnership? That The presiding officer should have said to every speaker or made a, an announcement at the beginning, if you're being paid here, you need to share that with the public. Uh, he didn't say that, and uh, Newsday didn't pick it up. Um, so when when the um, executive director of uh, Family and Children's Services, which has about a dozen sites, uh, and one of them is listed in here in Garden City, mm -hmm. he said um, things like, let me see, I wrote it down. He said, uh, Nassau County is number one in drug overdoses, but don't worry, because um, the casino won't bring drugs because drugs are already here. Well, I don't understand that. But what, what bothers me is, is he saying that as the chief executive of Family and Children's Services, or is he saying that influenced possibly, I don't know if he is, possibly by this partnership of which he's getting reimbursed or which he's been promised reimbursement for it from his agency. Um, I'm, I'm saying all these things and bringing, bringing these all up because I suspect that one of the next movements is going to be before Hempstead Town Supervisor um, Don Clavin. And I hope that all of us will insist that, that when that hearing cut takes place, hopefully it will take place, hopefully we will have a hearing, that Mr. Clavin, uh, Supervisor Clavin insists, if you're getting paid, if you're getting reimbursed, if your agency is getting reimbursed, you have to reveal that. You're not, a, you're not an, an indifferent person. Oh. Um, and, and I wonder, um, I wonder, um, Mayor, if there's any possibility you would consider inviting um, some of the speakers on the Community Advisory Committee, like Ed Raw or Kevin Thomas, to come to the village and hear residents and hear what they're saying. Um, there are five. Excuse me. There are five people on that committee, and it, it's not looking good. If we lose. Ed Ra or Kevin Thomas or Don Clavin. Wow, I think we're finished. I think it's, 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 well, I don't know if we're finished, but it doesn't look good. Um, so in closing, I wanted to say that anybody who was there on Sunday or Monday, whether you spoke or you didn't speak, yeah, um, you, you're my hero. And I just want to put a shout out to my golf buddies who were there. Um, 
uh, Dave Sebring and uh, Roger McFeely and Regan Flood. Thank you. Thank you. Leo, if I could make some comments to you. Um, I thought your uh, testimony, if we want to call it that, or your performance in front of the legislature was excellent. You made some very, very good points. As far as uh, Governor Patterson, I guess out of respect, I called him that when he, when he started saying, you know, all the great jobs this was going to have and, and would take care of the brain drain that we've been complaining about for decades. And I said, no, it wouldn't. I don't see how we thought that. And I was also appalled as you were with Dr. Reynolds' comments because I had a good dear friend of mine who was on the board of Family and Children's. She's no longer around. And I, I would have, if she was, I certainly would have contacted her and said, how can he make comments like that? Like drugs are a big problem, but we're not gonna have any problems with this. I just have to say, after talking to a number of people, and I know the presiding officer, Rich Nicolello, personally, I had a, con a long conversation with him the Saturday before. I had a conversation with him and probably the last conversation I'm gonna have with him after it. A lot of money was thrown around. A lot of things have been promised. Judgeships, all sorts of things. I can't go into too much more detail than that, but it, it certainly has happened. And I think the whole thing was a sham. And thank you for your service on the Environmental Advisory Board. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Andrew D. Schumel at Garden City. Uh, about the casino, I heard David Patterson on the radio say that this was a blighted area. It's not a blighted area. It's a refuge for birds and it's open and it's green. Saying that it's a blighted area, the guy's a bum. I like to punch him out. I don't care if he is blind. Um, regarding the uh, uh, Belmont, Mayor, imagine somebody straps a, a saddle on your back, fits a bridle in your mouth, okay, and then somebody sits on that saddle and now you got to run as fast as you can with the spectators cheering that you run faster and faster and faster. Horse racing is barbaric. What's next? Bullfighting? Gladiators? We're supposed to be civilized. As a kid, I went to camp in New Jersey. It was a very, very big Catholic camp. There were wildflowers everywhere. The place was like a paradise. It was like heaven. The air was clean. The fragrance was amazing. In Garden City, the fragrance of the air is dirt. Weeds are wildflowers that haven't matured. On Long Island, there are at least 100 species of wildflowers. Have you ever seen a, 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 a grove of wildflowers? No, because we're, we're we don't we don't appreciate what's available to us. All right, what happened to Chicago? Okay, first, totally impressed with all the dedication and professionalism demonstrated by all of the speakers here tonight. Uh, is there anyone who contribute wisdom in the USA? How many functional communities? have been conquered by crime and litter. Many, many. How did this happen? I think I know the answer. It all starts with dogs. Easily I could assault the dignity of everyone here tonight by describing what I witness on a constant basis in the village of Garden City especially in the village heart, 7th Street between Hilton Avenue and Franklin Avenue. Suffice it to say, I'm not going to go into detail, which I could, but suffice it to say, on Sunday, 7th Street, the heart of the village, reeks of dog urine. 
okay? The standard is lowered. Communication is disrupted. You, unity is fragmented. Resistance is diluted. Crime and litter win. Good people move out. Bad people move in. Garden City becomes a Hempstead annex. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions in the room on non-agenda items or comments? Steve Gray. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, board members. First of all, I'd like to thank the mayor and second deputy mayor and trustees Torino and Harrington for their participation in the meet and greet that was held this past week. It was very illuminating on two subjects which have already been discussed, but not, I don't think as agenda items. One is the Western Firehouse. And uh, my only concern there, not really a question is, I hope that all the structural issues are resolved because we're gonna have heavier equipment and when I was a while ago on the Western Property Association evaluation of this subject, there were questions about whether or not the new heavier equipment uh, would be sustainable based on the existing foundation. So I hope that's being addressed now. But my, my real question now for myself and a colleague of mine, George Salem deals with the senior center. And there was a very, very lively discussion at the meet and greet, which I didn't participate in, but I found it was very enjoyable. But I have a couple of questions, and if I may, and I assume these are probably to you, sir, the Department of Buildings. Um, you mentioned there was a recent discussion, and now there is a plan, presumably, to fix the bubbling or whatever the problem is with the flooring. What is the understanding exactly as to what the cause of that problem is or has been recently. Whoever wants to answer it. I know there are a lot of people here that probably would like to know a little more about that. And I know I do. Mr. Gore, the problem with the floor is that the floor that was chosen is a laminate flooring. And that floor is designed to float on the underlayment in the building. When the flooring in the hallway was put down, after the floor was put down, a piece of molding was installed, and then a small piece of what is called quarter round molding was installed at the bottom of the large three inch molding. That quarter round molding was inadvertently nailed into the floor. The nails from the quarter round molding are preventing that floor from expanding and contracting uh, when the temperature changes. So the floor is not able to move. It's not, a, it's no longer floating. It's now fixed in place. And when it flexes, instead of shifting, it bubbles. So the process now is to remove the quarter round molding, remove the nails that are holding the laminate in place. We tested a small section on Tuesday and the floor did settle right back down as soon as the nails were removed. So we uh, actually have a meeting tomorrow with the contractor to uh, discuss removing the rest of the quarter ram molding and getting the floor to settle down. Okay. Thank you for that very clear explanation. I hope that the contractor understands it as clearly as you have dem demonstrated it. Uh, my question then is final question, two final questions. Number one, roughly how long is this gonna take to remedy? Uh, it, it should take a, a day or two. Um, honestly, once they start removing the quarter round, it should go pretty quickly. And secondly, is it going to cost the village any money? No. That's good. That's the best answer I heard. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions in the room on non-agenda items? Mr. Wilton. Good evening, Mayor and Board. John Wilton, President of the Garden City Chamber of Commerce. Um, I emailed Karen earlier today to let you know that we were requesting to close the street at four on Friday, not on five. Typically, it was closed at three, but we 
did some calculations and said we could get it set up if we closed at four. So I just wanted to let you know that we were closing at four if everybody was fine with that. Um, Laurel Park is having their first um, Friday night event in 10 years. So um, Naira has been working with them. Um, in the past, they didn't have it. They're now having it. I don't know what effect it'll have on us. Um, I do know that we would, we're not getting the starting gate that we normally get. It's already been going, it's going over. I spoke with them earlier today. They're gonna kind of try to come up with some other idea that kind of signifies the relationship with Naira. Um, I've spoken to the hotel a few times. As you know, there's the horse stables, the owners, they're all coming up from Tennessee and Florida and, and Oklahoma and whatever the case may be. Um, so we're pretty set. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we're okay. Um, I would like, I'll speak to the commissioner later. Uh, we're going to do a walkthrough with DPW on Monday, and also we're going to have the generator for the electricity, so I think we'll be set with that. And I think we're okay. I just kind of found out about the Floral Park thing two days ago and didn't know that they were kind of short-sheeting us a little bit without giving us an, uh, an update ahead of time. So it is what it is, but we'll go forward. I think it'll be a success. So anyway, the notice was just to say we're closing at four more than, more than five, which I said in the past. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work on this. Yes, Caruso. Uh, I'm Carl Russo, Six Edge Bay Road. Uh, the gentleman that was up here before who mentioned all the problems of the world. Uh, one thing that he did mention that really hits home with me, and it's a problem of dog urine. I mean, it may sound simple with all the problems that we do have, but it's, it's an epidemic. I mean, everybody has one or two dogs and they walk their dogs and they urinate all over the grass. The other day I was outside with my landscaper talking and this woman walks the dog and the dog just urinates right on my lawn. And I said to the lady very calmly, you know, that's killing the grass. And she gave me one of those, like, well, what do you want from me? Um, in the past, the village used to put in the Garden City uh, paper, the rules of uh, violating, you know, not curbing the dogs and, where you could be walking your dog and stuff like that. I know it's, it, it may sound stupid, but maybe you could put this in the paper again and publicize it. And, uh, you know, maybe for some people it'll hit home and they won't do it. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I live on Edgemere Road and, you know, I don't expect people to walk their dog in the street on Edgemere Road and get killed. But, Maybe they should walk on Edgemere Road. Maybe they should walk on a side street or whatever. And if if they're on the phone when they're walking the dog, they don't know what, what the dog is doing. And I do find not only urine, but I, I do find droppings on my grass and stuff like that. And I do find the plastic bags being thrown in the sewer from time to time, which I know is against federal law and everything. but. I mean, people know they're doing the wrong thing, but they just don't care. But maybe we just have to drum it in, into their heads and, and try to, uh, you know, see reality. I'll look, thank thank you. you. I'll look into what we've shared before and doing that again. I, Thanks. I can give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Any other uh, comments on non-agenda items in the room? Anyone? Not? Yes. Kathleen Oro for Maryland Avenue, the meet and greet that we had last week or the week before. Time flies too quickly as we get older. Um, it was a good meet and greet. And I want to thank the Department of Public Works because of a comment that I had made about, um, I guess it would have been, shall I say, the dip in the road, uh, ninth, um, as you turn from Cherry Valley, and my car and I were very happy tonight when I made that turn, and it was a nice flat surface, so I appreciate your prompt attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we will be having another one is on the calendar for June 28th, so we'll get the word out. It's a great way 
to, um, you know, have your issues raised in a less formal environment. So I encourage residents to come. Uh, anyone on Zoom with a comment on a non-agenda item? Okay. All right. There being no further comments, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings adjourned. Good night, everyone. Wow. <laughs>